my spooky crew and welcome back to my channel or welcome to my channel if this is your first time here. My name is Alex and thanks for coming to my spooky corner of the internet. All right, in the video before this one, I had covered Edinburgh Castle and I said I would cover Mary King's Close. Unfortunately, I ran out of time, so I am dedicating a video to Mary King's Close. The story of Mary King's Close is fascinating. There is a lot of history with it. There's also hauntings reported with Mary King's Close, but also there's some myth tied with it as well. And I'm going to do a deep dive on the history, the hauntings surrounding it, and also my theories as to why Mary King's Close is so haunted. And I'm not going to default to the most obvious answer, at least not in the beginning. So sit back, relax, grab a hot drink or a cold drink, depending on when you're watching this, and let's get started. But before we do that, be sure to click on that subscribe button, give this video a like, and be sure to click on that notification bell so you'll be the first to know when I upload a new video. And I have a Patreon. If you love the spooky stuff and want to become a super fan of the spooky stuff, I have a Patreon starting at just $3 per month. You can get a behind the scenes look at what I'm working on, including books, videos. Uh, I do usually do blooper reels when I have content to make a blooper reel with. This might be a blooper reel. And I also share sneak peeks of my upcoming books. And I do have a book that I am wrapping up. I am so happy to say I'm wrapping up. So my Patreon subscribers are going to get to see that. And then also, if you want some spooky shirts, spooky books, spooky buttons, spooky mugs, notebooks, all that fun stuff, you can head on over to my Etsy shop at thespookystuff.etsy.com. And last but not least, if you want more spooky content, ghost hunting tips, ghost stories, and all that good stuff, then head on over to my website at thespookystuff.com. All right, let's get started. Let's start with Mary King's Close. Where do we begin with Mary King's Close? So Mary King's Close is Today, it is an underground area that is essentially, I don't know how really to describe it, but let's just say the, the wealthiest of wealthy were not living at Mary King's Close. And also, Mary King's Close was not always underground. It was actually an above ground street. One could say that Mary King's Close was the location of Europe's first skyscrapers, one could argue that, but it was a series of tenement buildings in a closed street, hence the word close. So yeah, you can think of closes as private roads with a locked gate or some sort of like um, end, end point. Now, the reason why it was named Mary King's Close was because back then, as Edinburgh was starting and developing, streets would be named after prominent residents. In the situation of Mary King's Close, the most prominent resident was Mary King. Mary King was a famous merchant who traded fabric, and she was a widow who moved into the area with her four children in 1635. And fun fact, Mary King's Close was the second widest street in Edinburgh. People who were living in the Close in the 17th century, so these are people who, I mean, we're talking about 600 people here, so it's a lot of people in a very enclosed area. And it was primarily Edinburgh's underclass and lower class that lived in Mary King's Close. And it wasn't uncommon to have up to 16 people from three different families crammed into the same building and room. So it shouldn't be a shock that Mary King's Close was hit hard by the bubonic plague in 1644 and 1645. So when you have this many people living so close together, the spread of disease was imminent. Now, there is a myth, and this is a very well-known myth, that Mary King's Close was sealed off because Mary King's Close kind of became the epicenter of the bubonic plague. However, there is a lot of evidence that indicates that this whole sealed offness did not happen. Sealed offness. So the story is, is that because the plague was the epicenter in Mary King's Close and there were over 300 to 600 people infected with the plague, the residents of Edinburgh bricked up the entrance to Mary King's Close and entombed the residents in the area. But here's the thing, remember, Mary King's Close was not underground yet at this point, so it was sealed off, but I guess, you know, you, one could say people could find a way out. But here was the thing, it actually benefited the healthy people to take care of the sick people. So it wasn't uncommon to hear about families that would bring food to other sick families, uh, you know, get the medical supplies, uh, food, blankets, clothes, because at the end, it actually would benefit the community if they all took care of each other. But I will say that with Mary King's Close, you know, people weren't allowed to enter or leave, but it seemed 
that plague doctors seem to have an exception for this. Life continued as normal as possible. If there were families that were healthy, they were taken to a different area, and that area was called Bergmuir. I don't I don't have a Scottish accent or speak any sort of language tied with Scottish, so I totally butchered that pronunciation. But yeah, so if healthy families were taken to other areas. And those who were not able to leave Mary King's Close, they actually put up white sheets or white flags over their doors and windows that would indicate that they needed support. And this is how the deliveries of blankets, food, supplies, and whatnot, that's, that's how this happened. And one of the most famous plague doctors, George Ray, went to Mary King's clothes quite often. And this doctor came in wearing leather from head to toe with the famous, you know, bird mask with um, all these like very potent herbs in the beak so that, you know, he wouldn't have to smell, you know, rotting flesh and disease and everything. And essentially what George Ray would do to save a plague victim was that he would slice off the top of a victim's sore um, or just, or open it drain it, and then he would cauterize it with a red hot poker. And um, yeah, this was fairly painful. It was unbearable pain, but this was effective. And because George Ray was covered from head to toe in leather, the fleas that were really causing the bubonic plague could not get through to George Ray's skin and bite him. And he ended up surviving the plague. So if you were sick in Mary King's clothes, you put up the white sheet, you would get food, coal, blankets, clothes, supplies, and everything you needed to survive. And then in 1753, 1753 to 1760, the Royal Exchange was starting to get built. This is where Mary King's clothes started to become buried. So essentially what builders did was they knocked off the top of the buildings of Mary King's clothes and built the Royal Exchange over it. And they used the lower parts of the buildings for the foundation. After the plague and after the devastation had passed, people did make their way back to Mary King's clothes. So the plague ended in 1647. And then around 1685, Edinburgh saw a huge housing shortage. So this was the sign for people to move back into Mary King's Close because literally Edinburgh was running out of room. And I read this and I haven't really found anything to back it up, but there is a story that goes that there were two brothers that were hired to go into Mary King's Close to essentially remove any human remains that were left over from when Mary King's Close was sealed off. The legend is, is, that, is that instead of keeping the bodies intact, these two brothers actually got a saw and cut up the bodies so that they could be in more manageable pieces to carry up and down the stairs. And this is where the hauntings begin. So 1685, people were moving back into Mary King's Close. These brothers were in charge of removing the remains. They cut up bodies instead, and they don't really take care of the remains. And the hauntings start getting reported. So people start reporting seeing a dog, apparition of a dog. People were seeing apparitions and hearing unnerving noises. They were also seeing a young girl, severed heads, and apparently residents were seeing other body parts just appearing out of nowhere, which is chilling. But, you know, by 1753, people were being ordered to leave the area because, you know, the Royal Exchange was being built. The Chesney family was the last family believed to in inhabit Mary King's Close. They were ordered to leave in 1897 so that the Royal Exchange could be expanded. But from what I read, they didn't leave until 1902. Andrew Chesney, who was a member of that family, his apparition has also been seen. And then in World War II, Mary King's Close was used to store paperwork and also bomb shelters were being being built in Mary King's Close. And when Edinburgh was being attacked, people went down to Mary King's Close as a bomb shelter. So it seems like the hauntings of Mary King's Close, they could date back. We could say they date back as early as the 17th century. So we have Andrew Chesney, who was a member of the Chesney family, one of the last residents of Mary King's Close. His apparition has been seen. A male witch by the name of Major Thomas Weir was seen as he was walking down the path towards his execution. Because remember, witch trials, they happened in Scotland. And then we have the story of Annie and Annie's doll, which I think is really interesting. In 1992, a Japanese psychic by the name of Aiko Gibo visited Mary King's Close. She was visiting Edinburgh Castle as well as Mary King's Close. And up until this point, Aiko Gibo hadn't really had a lot of experiences. So she wasn't necessarily impressed with with the reported hauntings of the area. But then when she went to step inside a room, she could barely enter this room that dated back to the 17th century because of pain. And she also felt tremendous unhappiness. So she said, 
I cannot enter this room. It is too strong. There is a child beside me. Her little hand is clutching my trouser leg. I, I just cannot go into this room. She was separated from her parents. She wants to go home and see her family. Her desire haunts this place very strongly. So Aiko Gibo identified this child spirit as Annie. And it is believed that Annie was a child who had passed away during the plague. And Aiko Gibo was able to get into the room and she was able to further communicate and converse with this little girl. And apparently Aiko Gibo found out that Annie had lost her doll and was heartbroken. Aiko Gibo did something that I'm not surprised about. She went up to the Royal Mile Shopping Center and she went and bought a doll. Now I had heard that this was a tartan Barbie, but I've also heard other things about what kind of doll it was, but she bought a doll and she brought it back for Annie. And Aiko Gibo said that this doll brought peace to Annie and it brought comfort to her. And as long as this doll remained, then there would be peace in the area and there wouldn't be like turbulent hauntings from Annie. And people were so touched by the story that people started to bring Annie dolls. Now, sadly, the original doll that was purchased by Aiko Gibo has since disappeared. And when people go into this room, they say that they can feel like a child grabbing their leg. They feel like their hand is being held. They also report feeling a sense of dread and feeling really cold. And needless to say, Annie is one of the most famous spirits that is believed to be haunting Mary King's Close. There are a lot of theories we could speculate as to why Mary King's Close is haunted, and I have a few. The company that currently runs the tours of Mary King's Close, they do a really immersive presentation, like they're dressed in period clothing. Oftentimes they are cast based on real life people who actually lived or frequented Mary King's Close. Because I believe that performance, especially like theatrical performance and utterances of words long past, I believe that this could spark some sort of activity, whether it's from conscious spirits or just reawakening the energy of the area. And personally, I believe that when you have guides who are dressed up in period clothing, oftentimes strongly resembling the people who once live there, I feel like this could contribute to the energy and the potential hauntings of the area. But also you have a place that went through immense trauma. So not only did you have the plague, I mean, the bubonic plague was traumatic enough, but you also had the, the medical procedures that the doctors were doing, you know, cutting off boils off of what was usually in the armpit or in the groin, you know, slicing off these boils and then cauterizing it with fire. That's that's traumatic and it, it causes someone to go through unbearable pain. And then of course we could speculate that a lot of like the apparitions that have been seen, the voices that have been heard, uh, the body parts seen, a dog that has been seen. We could also speculate that this could be residual if you are a believer in the stone tape theory and the idea that the external environment could absorb energy, then, you know, one could say that maybe Mary King's Close absorbed all of that energy and then plays it back like a broken record player. And then also you have the, the encapsulation of energy, so to speak. So you have literally the Royal Mile, the Royal Mile with expensive shopping centers and stores and boutiques and this very affluent area on top of Mary King's Close. And then below you have this area that was essentially tenement buildings where people were living in squalor, you know, several hundred years ago. It's just a very strange um, and ironic juxtaposition there where it's like you got the rich bougie stuff on top and then you have people living in squalor below. But when these buildings were knocked down or at least the top of the buildings were knocked down and, and, you know, roads were paved over, you know, all of that energy then became condensed. And then of course, with the amount of times that Mary King's close has been closed down or sealed off with nothing at all, a lot of it with unresolved trauma, unresolved energy. I mean, I'm sure at some point, this is all ghost theory, by the way, I'm sure that can contribute to some sort of buildup. And then of course you have paranormal investigators going in there, people taking ghost tours and exploring that and giving it attention. And if there are conscious intelligent spirits there, they're going to notice these people who are investigating and they're thinking, oh, someone's here to listen to me. Someone, someone's here that acknowledges me. So I don't know. Those are my theories as to why Mary King's Close could be haunted. And this is a place that I really want to visit. So, you know, let me know what you think. You know, do you think the extensive history can contribute to this? 
to this haunting or the events that took place or the myths that have been told? You know, could it be possible that with this myth that Mary King's Close was sealed off with no one coming in or out, could that have created its own energy with enough people believing in it? I would love to know what you think. And if you visited Mary King's Close, please let me know in the comments and let me know about your experiences because I would love to hear them. And before you go, don't forget to click on that subscribe button, give this video a like, click on that notification bell, and I will be back next week with another video. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you in the next round.